How's it going? Good. My name is Sasha Fenn. My pronouns are they slash them. I'm giving a talk today about a tool I've made called Sweepweed. If it looks like you're in the wrong room, stay here. <laughs> I've heard that stories are a memorable way of doing these sorts of talks. They help make these talks more memorable. So I'm going to start my talk with a story. There's a game designer named Chris Crawford, and he made a tool called Storytron. It looked a little bit like this. He worked with it for years, uh, maybe even decades, and he eventually decided it was far too complicated for anyone, himself included, to actually use to make games with. So he decided to throw that out <laughs> and start completely from scratch, make a new game engine that, that was as simple as he could possibly make it, have a design by subtraction or minimalist kind of design. He was familiar with Java, but he wasn't as familiar with JavaScript. So in late 2020, he put out a call for volunteers saying, hey, I think it would be better for this engine to be made in HTML and JavaScript. I thought, how hard could that be? <laughs> Two and a half years later, here I am, and I responded to that call and made a tool. I am glad that I originally set out to implement his design, because if I had set out to implement my own design, I think I would have gotten so mired in scope creep that I wouldn't have gotten something ready to present to you all. Uh, I did make it a bit more complicated than he initially recommended, but uh, I've been very careful in my additions, and I've gotten a lot of feedback from Chris Crawford himself and folks like Chris Conley. Uh, Chris Crawford has a, a nice online community of researchers that have helped me build this, you know, help, help give me feedback and such. I'm going to roughly divide my talk up into the different elements of a story. I'm mostly going to talk about plot and game mechanics, but in a more traditional novel, you have a plot. In a game, it's more mechanics that generate the plot while you're playing. You also, of course, have characters. I thought about using a lot of AI-generated images in my slides. This is the only one I got that looked good enough to use, but I'm proud of that one. There are character relationships and when you're making a game, oftentimes you're going to model those relationships using some kind of global variables. So floating point variables, integer values, and maybe a bunch of Boolean values, something along those lines. And then, of course, you have the themes of the work that you're trying to communicate. Games have a lot of basic structures that work really well if you have good writers, and oftentimes they do. Some of my favorite games have a linear structure. Uh, both of the Psychonauts games are some of my favorites. They have a pretty much linear structure with a lot of optional content. A lot of games have a linear structure until the end, and then they have multiple endings. Those work well. Uh, the, the Myst franchise it has a lot of that. Sometimes you have a branching tree and the classic problem with a branching tree is that as you expand it with more branches based on the choices the players are making, you run into a combinatorial explosion. So here we have 67 nodes worth of content that we would have to write. We have three options per node, the first two turns, two per node, the second two turns, and there's only four turns worth of game but 67 pages worth of content, so that's not really feasible. And there are a lot of ways game designers try to solve this problem. A storylet system combines a lot of these methods together, so I'm going to go over the methods and then talk about how a storylet system combines them. The first method is called foldback. There's different ways of calling it, but that's what I'll call it here. And the basic idea is you have a single destination 
but multiple paths go to that destination. So here we have only 26 nodes of content. You still have four turns worth, and you still have you know, six, seven different endings there. So you still have a lot of player agency in, in the choices they can make, but you're reducing your workload or it, framing it another way, you're multiplying how much productivity you have for the amount of effort that you put in. Another structure is what I call a quest forest. A lot of role-playing games do this, where you have a lot of itty-bitty trains that are more or less independent of each other. And you can branch the story within each miniature tree or quest, but because they're relatively independent, you don't run into that problem of combinatorial explosion nearly as much. So here you have six to seven turns worth of content, give or take. A player can probably also choose what order they do the quests in to some extent, that kind of thing. That works pretty well. And then the one that a lot of people in the audience are probably thinking of is global variables. So for example, early on in the story, you can have a situation where the player can choose to defend a friend of theirs or to betray them. And depending on the player's choice, a global variable, how much that friend trusts the player character, will increase or decrease. And then later on, you can branch the story based on that global variable. So if the global variable is high enough, you can go one direction. If it's low enough, you can go a different direction. You're basically deciding how that character is going to respond based on their feelings towards the player character and potentially towards the other NPCs. For example, if you have one character giving a present to another character, the other character might grow to love the first character. Putting that all together in a storylet system works something like this. In a storylet system, you have a lot of little pieces of content. Each of those pieces has certain selection criteria that says this is when this can occur. You have some internal content that says this is what happens when the storylet occurs. And then there are effects and changes to those global variables based on the choices the player makes and the choices that the characters make as well. And then every turn or at certain points in the game, the engine will select which storylet is going to occur based on the current state of global variables. I have a number of examples here that I put together to try and help folks understand this. In this case, we have three different storylets, so relatively simple. We have two, three characters, Alice, Bellamy, and Christina. Alice has something she would like to confide in someone about. She could confide in Bellamy, she could confide in Christina, or she could confide in neither of them and just open a bookstore and spend all her time reading and getting away from people, which sounds great. And which storylet is going to occur is based on the desirability of that storylet in the state of those global variables. So in this case, the first encounter is going to have a desirability equal to negative 0.3, because you just have a script setting the desirability of that encounter equal to how much Alice currently trusts Bellamy. Similarly for uh, the story involving Christina, and then the bookstore is kind of a default storylet. So the variables in my system, Sweep Weave, are all bounded numbers. It's a term I'm borrowing from Chris Crawford. There's a number ranging from right above negative one to right below positive one, and it never goes out of those bounds. So zero is kind of a default if Alice trusts neither of them very well, if both of those global variables over there were negative, then the third storylet would be the one that would be chosen by the system. Giving some other examples, suppose that Alice is interviewing someone named Bree, and the default encounter 
is Alice is going to ask Bree more questions to try and get to know her better. If Alice has already made up her mind, she's going to conclude the interview. So in this case, we use the absolute value of Alice's trust in Bree. Because if that's high, she's made up her mind. She has strong feelings about Brie one way or the other. If the absolute value of that relationship is low, she still hasn't quite made up her mind yet. And in this case, uh, the absolute value would be 0 0.5, which would be greater than 0 0.4, so she's going to conclude the interview. If it's negative 0 0.5, she would also conclude the interview. If it's zero, she would ask more questions. Here's a more complicated example. We have a couple different variables over there. I've added a mood. We have Alice's energy level and how much Alice trusts Brie. So we're still using the absolute value of Alice's trust in Brie, but we're also adding Alice's energy level to that. We're basically taking an average of those two numbers and that's the desirability of the first story loop. And then the second one has a constant desirability because that's the default. And just to show you briefly what this looks like in the Sweep Weave software, this is what Sweep Weave looks like. I'm using something called an inverse parser for my interface. So there's no such thing as writing code for your scripts. If I edit the desirability script for this reaction, Alice asks, asks another question, then I'm going to get a tree structure like this. I have at the root the average or arith arithmetic mean of these branches, and then we have the absolute value of Alice's trust in Brie, which is currently 0 0.5, and Alice's energy. So you have a tree structure for all of your scripts. It's basically a mathematical function. You can make it complicated if you want to, but usually you don't need it to be very complex. I also have a fairly short list of operators there. This is not a Turing complete system. If you're wanting to make a game that has a, a representation of physical space, this is not going to be the right engine. If you're wanting to make you know, a game that involves a lot of randomness, you might be surprised that this is also not a good engine. Uh, this is a completely deterministic system. Most storylet systems involve a lot of randomness. There's a certain chance that it, a storylet will occur, but in this case, it's based on desirabilities. So if you take the same path to the story as a player, you're gonna get the same result. And I think that makes playtesting a lot easier. I'll briefly go over here and show you the script results if I can. Yeah. I guess it doesn't show that. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so this is the in editor playtesting. You output the files as standalone HTML pages, but you can also playtest them within the editor. And if you do, do it within the editor, it gives you a script report. So you have the basic variables. Zero, Alice trusts Brie 0 0.5. This is Alice's current energy level. This is at this current point in the game, which is just the first turn. And then it feeds into the root of those scripts. So the arithmetic mean of these is going to be 0 0.25, which means that's the desirability of that particular response and the desirability of this response is zero. Back to slides, maybe, here we go. Okay. Here's another example. In this case, I'm using something called a proximity operator, which is an operator I invented it gives you a higher number the closer two variables are to each other, and it gives you a lower number when they're farther apart. So it's, this is open source software, by the way. If you want to know the formulas for everything, you can check it out in the code. Uh, but if they're right at each other, it's going to be something like 0 0.99. So in this case, 
we have three different story lifts that can occur. Alice is going to ask Bree about her background if Alice's trust in Bree is close to zero. So she doesn't have a strong opinion one way or the other. The idea is when it's a positive number, she's going to like Bree. And if it's a negative number, she's going to distrust Bree. Alice is going to hire Bree if her trust in Bree is high. And then Alice is going to decide not to hire Bree if her trust in Bree is low. And we do that by just multiplying her trust by negative one. There's something called a, a negation operator in the scripting system that you can use to do that. I want to discuss the internal structure of an encounter. The examples I've given are a bit broader and apply to other storylet systems potentially. But in Sweepweave, storylets are called encounters, and they have this kind of internal structure. So you have some scripts that determine when the encounter is going to occur. Then you have some text, and it's just a set piece of text that says, when this encounter occurs, this is what happens. So you are uh, at the entrance of a dark cave, and you have another character with you who's scared to go in the cave and yada yada. And then the player has a list of options they can choose from to decide what they're going to do. And then each option has a unique list of reactions associated with it. And the reactions are the game's reactions to what the player did. And then each reaction has a list of effects. That's how you change the global variables. So it's, I know it seems a little math heavy perhaps, uh, but in practice, the mathematical functions that you're going to be using are going to be pretty straightforward. Something like just the number 0 0.2, like a constant or a very small tree of operators. So I have some examples of different encounters here. In this case, uh, Alice says to Brie, have some pancakes, I made them myself. And of course, Alice wants uh, Brie to really enjoy these pancakes and say the player is acting as Brie and the player can either eat the pancakes and say, ooh, these are delicious, or they can say, eh, no thanks, I already ate earlier. And how Brie interprets that is going to be based on those global variables. So if Brie uh, trusts, uh, I forgot which character was the player. If the non-player character trusts the player character, then they'll interpret no things they already ate earlier as kind of benevolence, yeah, I already ate earlier. If they don't trust the player character, then they'll say, oh, you're just, you just don't want to eat my cooking or something like that. So, in this case, you'd set the desirability of this reaction equal to trust. You set the desirability of this reaction equal to zero. And when trust is greater than zero, this is what's going to happen. When it's less than zero, this is what's going to happen. That is the internal structure of an encounter. And it's always that internal structure. You can link a reaction to another encounter to have a more complex tree but the expectation is that you're going to use that sparingly. This is the whole cave example I gave earlier. That cave is too dark. We might be eaten by Gru's. And the, the player says, we'll be fine. Trust me. And in that case, they're appealing to how much that character trusts them. If the character trusts them enough, they'll say, okay, well, you go first. I'll follow you in. If the character doesn't trust them enough, they'll get left behind. Or the player can say, well, let's take another option. And again, the response is going to be based on how much that character trusts them. You can have one reaction per option. And early on, that's probably what you're going to do. Because early on, I'll get, get into this a little bit later, because this is a completely deterministic system, you're going to start with the relationships all in the same place. So you don't have the ability to give a lot of feedback early on. So you'll have a section of your game where it's basically one reaction per option, and then you go to the next encounter. And then later on, you'll have two or three reactions per option, depending on how much writing you're able to do. Obviously, perhaps 
you can use different variables in your scripts for different reactions. So reactions up here are comparing fear and confidence. You just set the desirability of this equal to fear. You know, one character's fear of another. So in this case, the character says, it's you, my mortal enemy. And the player says, give up. And the player is kind of appealing to intimidation, trying to say, I can beat you. And if the character's fear of the player is greater than their confidence, they'll surrender. If otherwise, they'll say never. And then down at the bottom, the player is saying, well, we don't have to fight anymore. Let's end this peacefully. And in that case, they're appealing to how much the character trusts them. So you're using different variables in, in different scripts here. But the, the basic idea is when the player picks an option, the game calculates the desirability of each reaction. It selects the reaction that has the highest desirability. You can also have multiple characters. So in this case, someone says to the player, well, you're going to need help to run this ship. And the player can say, well, my friends are here. They're, they're going to help me, right, everyone? And then the game knows which character loves the player the most. And that's the player that, or that's the character that's going to step in and say, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm by your side. I'm going to help you out. Uh, similarly, it can track which character is most afraid of the player character. So you just set the desirability of each of these reactions equal to uh, how much a particular character trusts the player character. Getting into the broader structure of the story world, the simplest way to do this is just to have a linear sequence of encounters. And I was a bit surprised at this idea when Chris Crawford introduced it to me years ago, but it's kind of grown on me. You can have a lot of feedback and interactivity within each encounter using those reactions. So you could actually just have a linear sequence of encounters, which you can just do by setting the desirability of each encounter to a constant, so 0 0.9, 0 0.8, and you count down. Uh, the idea is, Typically, an encounter is only going to occur once during a story, which is, again, different from systems like Story Nexus, where they have a lot of repeating of storylets. Uh, in this system, there's supposed to be a kind of forward momentum through the story. So each encounter occurs basically once. And if you have a linear sequence, you can change what happens within each encounter based on those reactions. But then you go to the next encounter, and then at the very end, you would branch the story based on the current state of those global variables. And the idea here is that basically every turn, you might have an introductory stage where you can't do this too much because the player is still learning about the story world. But at some point, most of your game, the player is going to be changing those relationships. So the idea here is instead of having one or a few critical decisions at certain branch points in narrative, you have a cumulative effect of a hundred small decisions or two hundred small decisions that the player makes over the course of the game, building those relationships. And the whole focus of this engine is on the player building those relationships with these characters, these emotional uh, relationships with these characters. Rather than a tree, this reminds me a little bit of a cactus, because the Internal structure reminds me a little bit of the thorns of a cactus. It's kind of a silly metaphor. But you could do something like this where it's mostly linear, but you have occasional branches uh, based on the global variables. And here's more or less how you would do that. So in this case, you just set the desirability of this encounter equal to one character's trust in another. Set this one equal to zero. And when it gets to a certain point in the game, it's going to decide between those encounters based on that. Uh, there's also something called a spool in Sweep Weave. A spool is just a list of encounters. So as you go through, you can kind of organize your encounters and 
the game is only going to look at those schools that are currently active and say, I'm going to select an encounter from one of these, uh, from one of these active schools, and it's going to ignore the rest. And it would look a little bit like decks of cards. Oftentimes, uh, a deck of cards is used as a metaphor for a storylet system where each storylet's a kind of card. But if each of these is a school, it's going to get to a school, go through those, and then there will be an encounter that deactivates that school and activates a different one, and it will go to the next one. And that kind of thing. Character relationships. I'm borrowing the philosophy behind Storytron here and the philosophy of, of Chris Crawford's uh, design over the course of his career. Stealing, perhaps, might be a better term than borrowing. So, in Sweepweave, you can track different types of relationships. You can just have personality traits. I had a, a slide earlier that had the mood of a particular character. That would just be a number attached to a particular character. You can also have one character's perception of another. So the idea is that a relationship is Alice's perception of Bellamy or Alice's perception of another character's personality trait. So my trust in you would be my perception of how honest you are, where honesty would be a kind of personality trait. And that means relationships involve two different perceptions. You have Alice's perception of Bree and Bree's perception of Alice, and those can be different numbers. Alice may think a lot more highly of Bree than Bree thinks of Alice. And if you really want to get more complicated than Chris Crawford would recommend, then Sweep Weave also lets you have circumferential relationships. And the idea here is that if you have a love triangle, uh, Alice might be wondering about whether or not Bree and Christina are in love with each other. And that can determine Alice's behavior. So Alice's perception of Christina's perception of Bree and Bree's perception of Christina is going to make a difference. And at this point, I want to give a strong word of advice about how to design your personality and relationship model in this kind of a game. The reason you need a relationship model in the first place is to facilitate interactivity. If you have a relationship that's not doing that, you don't need it. So the idea here is, as the player goes through the story, the player makes choices, those impact those relationships or the moods of the characters, and then that determines how the characters choose to behave later on in the game. If you have some kind of relationship that isn't affecting how the characters are acting, isn't affecting whether they're making this choice or a different choice, then you don't need that relationship. If the, player is, if the character is going to make a certain choice regardless, then you don't have to have the, the relationship in, in your system. So you need to be very selective in designing your personality model. Uh, Sweeply lets you create your own uh, bounded number variables that are attached to the characters, and it fills in the blanks for you. So you just say, I want a relationship variable of each character's perception of every other character, and it automatically produces that for you. And you interact with it using an inverse parser. As I said, the whole idea of that is to avoid syntax errors. You should never have to worry about missing a semicolon. Sweep we've only lets you say something to it that it knows it will understand, is at least the goal if I've done things properly. And if I haven't, send me a bug report. Going back to what I said a little bit earlier, a core idea here that I've noticed in participating in some game jam entries the past couple of years is that at the beginning, the knowledge that the players have 
is going to be the first thing to increase. At the start, the players probably want a period where they can learn about the characters in the position of relative safety. They know that their choices aren't going to completely destroy their ability to succeed, whatever that happens to mean in the story world. And so they're exploring and learning about the characters, and then sometime after that, the impact of the player's choices start to increase. And then after that, you're able to give feedback. Uh, you have to have a period of time, at least half a dozen turns, or probably more like a dozen or, or more turns, where the player can change the state of those global variables so that how the characters respond is going to differ from playthrough to playthrough. So you start with giving the player the chance to explore, then you start by having their choices have some effect on those global variables, and then you give them feedback. And then at a climactic point in your game, the player has to basically call on those characters that they've been building these relationships with, and that determines which ending they get. If the characters like them, they'll come to their aid. That's kind of a simple example, but I'm sure you can imagine more nuanced and, and subtle stories to do with the system, but that resolution is going to be based on those global variables. I want to talk as well briefly about the game GM entries. So I worked with Chris Conley, and I'm going to mispronounce the gentleman's name. I apologize to him. I think Mark Larosini, something along those lines, on a game called Common Moonlight a couple of years back. We submitted it to the Game Makers Toolkit Game Jam. And the idea was you'd have a, a kind of funeral situation. We wanted to have a situation with very few characters. Each author picked a character to write. And I learned that a lot of changes need to be made to the system to make collaboration easier. Uh, in terms of making it easier to merge files together, that kind of thing. So I've tried to design it since then so that you can work together with other authors to make story worlds, you can share the, the JSON files that the projects are saved to, and hopefully have an easier time writing enough content to make a story world. Because you still need a fair amount of content here. Uh, you need enough encounters like a very simple story world might have half a dozen encounters for each stage, and you'd have three or four different stages here. You know, time to increase their knowledge, time for their choices to have an impact, feedback, and resolution. Uh, the Wildlands was overly ambitious. The Wildlands was a game we made uh, for last year's Game Makers Toolkit Game Jam. I made that with Chris Conley and George Dawson. And because I was too ambitious, I tried to do stuff with the engine, and it was buggy, and the version of the game that we submitted to the jam was a version where the reaction scripts weren't really working. They were just, the characters were choosing a particular reaction no matter what the relationships were. Oops. Uh, but in the future, I still like the setting, so I, I'm going to try and uh, work with Chris Conley, hopefully, to build a more full-fledged and working version of that. But there is a game I want to shout out one of my patrons. Um, I believe it's Pixel Brownie Software, if I recall correctly, who made a game called Quinn and Ben using my engine. And that's a more polished game. It's a short romance story. I guess it doesn't explicitly say whether it's a romantic relationship or not, but it's a, a short game about a relationship between two characters. I thought it was really well polished. So look up Quinn and Ben, and you'll have perhaps the best current showcase of the system. And because I like interactivity, I want to open the floor to questions. Thank you. How much time do I have time for questions? 
Yeah, I have tons of questions. Yes. 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 So describe the sentence in terms of Hello, is that better? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you've described the sentence in terms of relationships between characters. Could it be generalized to player relationships with systems rather than to other characters? Um, can you give me an example of a player relation to a system? So, let's say you're making a game that's set on a spaceship and the player is interacting with an oxygen system and you get encounters based on different levels of oxygen or how dire the situation is. Okay. You could probably do something like that. Uh, all of the global variables are either bounded numbers between negative one and one, or technically Booleans, because the spools can be on or off, so you can use those as Boolean flags. So if you can represent it using that type of, of data, then you could, could do that as well. I guess you could also have a character that is a government or some kind of organization rather than a person, uh, or you, like you said, you could have a, a machine that would be a character uh, as long as you can represent it using those sorts of numbers, you could do something like that, yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Sure thing, thank you for the question. Um, go for it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Can, can she be heard? They, they be heard? Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm curious about, so when all the examples that you gave of your kind of like story lit, um, um, just like decision making structure, the de like desirability column in particular seemed like it was focusing on the desirability of an action for one particular character. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if that, so, and then, but then some of the sort of like global structure of the story uh, made it seem as though, like, I guess my, okay, my question is, is, is like desirability a single global variable or is that localized per character? And if the latter, how do you resolve like what actually happens um, on the basis or what order things might happen in, for example, if there are like multiple encounters that could apply, especially if they're mutually contradictory or uh, you know, uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in, in conflict with each other in some way. Okay. Sweepweave has a history book system. Every action the player takes and every reaction the engine selects is recorded, and every encounter that occurs is recorded. Encounters are selected in kind of a complex way. There's basically five stages. The reaction that occurred previously might lead directly to an encounter and force that encounter to occur. If that happens, that's what happens. Next stage, has this encounter occurred before? If it's occurred before, it's not gonna occur again. Next stage. And the, in, is, the, in, in the leading directly to thing, is that mm -hmm. like, um, also, if this is too complicated, we can talk about it offline. It was yeah. More, yeah. It was more just kind of like in your system, like how, when things are running. Is, is an encounter always ex with exactly one other character? I guess maybe that would be a simplifying. So at the beginning they were, okay. but not anymore. Okay. Um, partially due to feedback from Chris Conley and folks in, in Chris Roberts' community, I, I decided to change that. So. Uh, in one of my slides, I gave an example where you have three different characters, and the character that loves the player character the most is the one that steps in and says, hey, I'm your friend, I'm going to help you right. out. Right, there's, like there's like an initiative system or something that needs to happen to figure yeah. out who gets to... Yeah. So in that case, you have three global variables uh, for each of those characters, and you just set using a reaction script which can be any tree you want to make here. 
Mm -hmm. You use one of these scripts to set the desirability of that reaction to whatever that relationship is currently at. Okay. Um, so you can have storylets involving different characters. You can also, I don't know if you've played the game Celeste, mm -hmm. but there's a moment in Celeste where you have two characters having a conversation with each other and the player can actually choose, like they're controlling both characters simultaneously. And you could do something like that here uh, as well. But I'm trying to remember what your original question was. It, like it was sort of about like how, how, how does action resolution or happen or how does encounter resolution happen? Yeah, kind of so or? encounters have acceptability scripts. So you can say, if one encounter has occurred, this other encounter cannot occur. Going forward. But there might be multiple encounters that can occur, and in that situation, how do you choose? How do you choose? You have the one that has the highest desirability. Highest so, desirability for who? Um, whoever you choose as the author. So you can go into the desirability script. And, and is that global? Like, it's, there, there's always just one character whose desirability to determine. You can have uh, whichever variables you choose to have. So you can have Alice's trust in Bree. And oh, then, so, so you like author a desirability function. So this is a yes. global variable. Basically. Yes. Okay, that's, yes. What I was, that's what I was asking. If it was like a single global variable that determines that. Okay. Yeah, so okay. It, it can be multiple global variables as well. Mm -hmm. So you, the desirability is a mathematical function right. you, yeah, that you, you, that you as an author design. Okay, gotcha. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Sasha, thanks for the great talk. Thank this you. This illuminates many things for me. Um, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of double check on the terminology. Um, mm -hmm. Just, I want to make sure my mental model's right here. So it sounds like for desirability scripts, they're essentially like the prerequisites in a traditional storylet. Is that fair, a fair assumption to make? Uh, they're similar. So if you're familiar with Emily Schwartz's uh, blog posts about storylet systems, and all of you need to be. They're amazingly excellent articles. Go read those. This is a salience engine, I believe. So desirability scripts are just the salience of a given encounter, if you're looking at that desirability script, or a given reaction, if you're looking at those. Um, the acceptability scripts are Boolean. So it checks acceptability first. If the acceptability script returns true, which by default, it just is true, then it's going to say, what's the desirability? And it's going to say, here's two encounters. This has a desirability of 0 0.5. And this one has 0, and you go with the 0 0.5. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I guess like, and my last one would be um, for spools. Um, would you would you see that they're kind of like generic, not really containers, but like generic categories we can sort our encounters into? Um, and, yeah. um, sorry, uh, it's related. Um, based on the documentation, it seems like we can utilize spools in different ways, and if so, um, can you give us some examples? Yeah, the main reason I wanted to set up a spool system was to divide a narrative up into different scenes. So in The Wildlands, the game from last year's uh, Game Reader's Toolkit Game Jam, I had two scenes in a narrative sense. The spool system wasn't implemented yet, but I, I implemented spools partially in response to the troubles I had making that game. And I, I wanted to set it up so that I could have a spool for this scene, and I could say, this is the only spool that's active, and the encounters that my co-authors made aren't going to occur in the middle of the story that I'm trying to tell over here. So it's a way of trying to divide the game up and say, we're focused on this right now, encounters relating to this particular conversation with this character, or this series of interactions, that's what's occurring right now. Oh, so it's essentially, <laughs> it's essentially setting up more requirements or rather like criteria for which encounters we want. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. 
So are, are you saying that the acceptability of a given spool changes, and that's how you filter from one spool to another with an acceptability temporary criteria, or is it a different mechanism? So the spool check comes before the acceptability script. The, the five stages are, does a reaction lead directly to an encounter? Has this encounter occurred before? Is this encounter on a spool that is currently active? And then what is the acceptability of this encounter? And then what is the desirability of this encounter? And the way you activate and deactivate spools is you come over here and you have it an effect. So when a given reaction occurs, so when Alice chooses to ask another question, you can create an effect that occurs after she makes that decision. You can change a relationship. You can change the status of a spool to active or inactive. And if it's true, it's just active. If it returns false, it's inactive. So you turn them, turn them on and off that way. And then the next page is the direct link from a reaction to another encounter that I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. I read that real quick? Um, I could bring up the Discord. Yeah, no, you, I can, are you I have it here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, have you ever considered pairing the tracking of character state and character uh, relation state with AI generated content? As in prompting an LLM with all the context state of the story and the characters at any given point in time to generate a particular story led or to shape it. Parentheses feed the handcrafted story led and the context and ask, ask the LLM to alter it accordingly. I have thought briefly about using some of the, the tools that have been put out, like ChatGPT. I haven't done a lot of work with them yet, but there are people in the research community that I'm a part of uh, that are really into that stuff and are, are trying to look into that. I am a little bit skeptical right now. So the, the basic expectation here is that for an encounter, you just have a set piece of text. When this encounter occurs, this text is displayed. Then you have options that have a set piece of text and reactions that have a set piece of text. So it's supposed to have a more handcrafted feel. This is a major difference from something like Storytron, which was more mechanistic in how it felt. This is supposed to be handcrafted pieces of content that are combined together in, into a story. Uh, I would be really interested in people taking this, this system and trying to use some of those AI tools with it. I, I keep track of what they're, they're doing. So go for it if, if people want to try that. But um, I haven't done any work with that myself yet. Uh, hey, yeah, thanks for the talk, really cool. Um, I, uh, I had a question more sort of about your like collaboration process because I feel like this is kind of a semi-common situation you hear about where someone like, you know, has been around for a long time, more established, is partnering with someone younger to like make something happen. And I feel like often those collaborations don't end up working out. So I'm curious if you have any like wisdom to share about how you and Chris, you know, what your process was like, what, what that, how that worked for the both of you. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, back in, I want to say around 2013, 2014, somewhere in there, I apprenticed under Chris Crawford. And that was, I suppose, my first collaborative work. I got experience there and learned from his wisdom. Uh, the game that we tried to make folded pretty quickly, so it wasn't published, but, but I, I had a really great time doing it. And then I kept in contact with Chris Crawford after that. He eventually taught a course uh, on interactive storytelling that I attended, and I got to know a lot of people who were taking his course. He taught it over, over Zoom, I believe. It might have been Skype at the time I took it. And then more recently, Chris Crawford's running a monthly seminar session, which everyone should join, uh, and we have a Discord currently. So I have sought out collaborators from people in that community that I've been having discussions with about this, this technology and, and ideas. In terms of wisdom, I guess 
probably the obvious stuff. Be, be polite, be respectful. Um, I don't know if humble is the right term, but be, you know, flatter people, I guess. I guess um, it's easy for me because all the people I've worked with are literally amazing, so it's easy for me to say, hey, you guys are amazing. Can I, can I join in? But, um, yeah, in terms of the technical side, learn to use Git and learn to use GitHub and communicate really, really well. So the first game jam, we communicated over text chat through Slack at the time. And then the la last year's game jam, I spoke with Chris Conley over, I believe, Zoom uh, briefly, and, and we brainstormed our game because we only had 48 hours to make, make the game, which is not very long <laughs> for, for interactive fiction. Um, if you're making a tool, have unique IDs for everything. <laughs> because if you don't have unique IDs for things and you have connectivity between the different pieces of your game, you're going to potentially have collisions. Because if I, like in earlier versions of the tool, I would have a story file here that I'm working on and a different copy of the file another person's working on. And if I say, I'm going to refer to this particular encounter, has this encounter occurred before, or has this reaction occurred or something like that, if that doesn't have a unique ID and someone makes a change over here, it can break it when you try to merge the files together. So I, I had to go in after those game jams and say, okay, I need to radically change how everything works under the hood to try and make collaboration possible. There, there's a lot of technical things that have to go into making a tool where you can really collaborate well with it, which I wouldn't have, wouldn't have occurred. So I guess the last thing is practice. Find people you can collaborate with, and through collaborating, you're going to learn how to collaborate. That's probably the biggest thing. Hey, um, I, I enjoyed the talk, Cam. Uh, just a quick question. So um, I'm right in understanding this um, outputs to a website, so like, what's the yes. final? Uh, yes, do you, you, can, can you show us what, what the game looks like? Um, you, you can, you go, th you can, let's go to compile and play test actually. So it outputs to a standalone HTML page. By the way, the, I say there's text here. Technically this is HTML. So you can use HTML tags to do formatting. If you want to italicize things, uh, you, you can do that, but you can pile it to a standalone HTML story. Uh, if you want to, I don't know where I sent that to. If you have images in your story, you can use image tags to do that as well. I'm gonna try and figure out where I can pile this to. And, and the, those, those images are stored locally? It, it, does it, does it compile from like a folder or files or? Yeah, you, you can compile it to wherever you want. When you say compile and play test, it's supposed to automatically launch it in, ah, here we go. It's supposed to automatically launch it in your browser. I guess there's some kind of permission thing going on. Here we go. That's what I want. Uh, that'll work. So it compiles it to a game like this. You have a menu where you can start over or you can save your game. I've had tricky difficulties getting the save game system up and running. Currently I'm just saving it to cookies. I am not convinced that's the best solution, but that's the one I went with uh, currently. You have a transcript of everything that happens. So the transcript, uh, the, the player can look back at every everything they've done, everything that's happened, and it just goes through encounters. I can show you a more full-fledged work. Let's see here. I guess I can look at this one. I guess documents, no scope. 
So many years back, Chris Crawford wrote a rom-com. I'm not connected to the internet, am I? That's fine. Wrote a rom-com uh, story world, which he has a very interesting kind of dark sense of humor. But I basically took that and ported it to my system. So a lot of the writing is by him, but if I can find the file and compile it, then I will be able to show you a more full-fledged game. So this is rom-com. There's five different endings. It's a relatively small story world. I think I added a couple of encounters. This has 17 encounters, 31 options, 42 reactions, 68 effects, two characters, one of which is a player character, two spools. So one spool is just the introductory scene, and then the next spool is uh, a date between the two characters if you reach that point in the story. 2,604 words. I don't play fast. Yeah, I'll go with that. Ta-da! Okay, so things happen. You randomly encounter someone out in the woods somewhere, and you can make really bad decisions. So I could say, uh, I could say, you know, I can brag and lie about coming to this spot out in the woods for years, or I can tell them the truth. Let's say I, I lie to them, and then uh, they say, I love the view from this spot. It's so quiet and peaceful. I've never met or even heard anybody else here. I feel like I have the whole world to myself. And you can respond, well, it's usually quiet and peaceful. And then uh, you can ask them to go on a date. And because they don't like you because you've been uh, rude to them earlier on, they're going to say, no, I don't think so. And you, you get a silly ending that Chris Crawford wrote. Or you can have a different path. Let's pick some better options. Hey, no worries, I don't bite. And then tell the truth. Really, I found this place only about five months ago. By the way, um, I haven't uploaded this most recent version of this online yet, but you can play through this. I'll, I'll upload it after the conference, this, this particular demo game, and you'll be able to play through it if you want to. But let's say, I know what you mean. And then we'll ask them to go on a date. And they say, yeah. So now we get a different, uh, different reaction. So, oh, by the way, the text of the reactions is combined with the text of the next encounter. So from the player's perspective, it's supposed to feel like a twine game or like a game made in ink or choice script. Uh, you have a reaction. So this here, she hesitates for a moment and smiles and says, yeah, sure, why not? I believe that is the reaction. Let me see which one that is. Yeah, so in this encounter, she hesitates by the moment and smiles and says, yeah, sure, why not? That's a reaction that can occur. That's the reaction where she says, no, I don't want to go on a date. And the text of the reaction is there. This is the text of the next encounter. So from the player's perspective, it's all one story beat. But from the author's perspective, it's, it's different pieces of content that are combined like that. And then you go on the date. And depending on how the date goes, uh, you either get married and, and live happily ever after, more or less, or uh, you have some a terrible ending instead. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Yeah. Uh, we're at time. I gotcha. Thank you everyone so much. <laughs>